those who have nothing better to do in life than to follow my saga know that I have more or less abandoned the field of psychology and moved back to the field of finance and economics. I'm a professor of finance in uh, CIAPS and I served as economic advisor to several governments. I've written extensively on economic issues. You can find many of these writings online. And today um, I'm going to launch a cycle of two lengthy, of course, <laughs> lectures on banking. The first lecture will focus on commercial banking. And the second lecture, uh, the day after, will deal with central banking. And just not to hold you in suspense, the lectures are titled, Why Banks Are a Really Bad Idea. <laughs> so now you can switch off and go back to doing something a lot more useful, let alone pleasant. Banks are the most unsafe institutions in the world. Unsafe. Unsafe as in not safe. Worldwide, hundreds of banks crash every few years. Two decades ago, the United States government, um, four decades ago, I'm sorry, the United States government was forced to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in the savings and loans industry. A few days ago, there's been a collapse of two major banks in Silicon Valley and Credit Suisse, no less, is teetering on the brink. Multi-billion dollar embezzlement schemes are routinely unearthed. For example, those of you who have long memories and short hair, <laughs> the much fitted BCCI. And these embezzlement schemes wipe both equity capital and deposits. Bearings Bank, remember, having weathered 330 years of tumultuous European history, Napoleon included, Bearings Bank succumbed to a bout of untrammeled speculation by a rogue trader. In, 18, in 1890, by the way, <laughs> few people know that, but in 1890, the same bank faced the very same predicament, only to be salvaged by other British banks, most notably the Bank of England. And the list is interminable. In the 20th century, there were more than 30, three zero major banking crises once every two and a half years. That banks are very risky is proven by the inordinate number of regulatory institutions which supervise banks and the activities of banks. The United States, for example, sports a few organizations which ensure deposit depositors against the seemingly inevitable vicissitudes of the banking system. There's the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures against the loss of every deposit of uh, less than $250,000. There's the HLSIC, which insures depositors in saving houses in a similar manner. There are other regulatory agencies, too many to, to enumerate in this video, <laughs> to supervise banks, to audit banks, to regulate banks. It seems that you cannot be too cautious where banks are concerned. The very word bank is derived from an old Italian word, banca, bench or counter. Italian bankers used to conduct their business on benches. Nothing much has changed since, <laughs> maybe with the exception of the scenery. Banks hide their fragility and vulnerabilities. Um, they, they camouflage their essential fragmentation and problems behind marble walls. The American president, Andrew Jackson, was so set against banks that he dismantled the nascent central bank, the second bank of the United States. We'll come to it in the second, in the second part of this lecture when I will elaborate and elucidate the secret world of central banking. Banks create fiat money. They operate through credit multipliers. Let me explain this alchemy, <laughs> this magic. When there is a depositor, depositor A places $100,000 with bank A. Okay, depositor A, bank A, $100,000. Uh, 
Bank A puts aside, if we are lucky, 20% of the money. This is labeled a reserve. It is intended to serve as an insurance policy and a liquidity cushion. The implicit assumption is that no more than 20% of the total number of depositors will claim their money at any given moment, an assumption that's been falsified like a thousand times um, last century alone. Okay, in times of panic, when all the depositors want their money back, or even a big portion of depositors, for example, with, with Credit Suisse, the bank is rendered illiquid, having locked away in its reserves only 20% of the funds. So if 40% of the people come to claim their money, the bank is bust. Commercial banks hold their reserves with a central bank or with a third party institution, explicitly and exclusively set up for this purpose. Okay, $100,000, $20,000 in reserves. What does bank A do with the other $80,000? The $80,000 that do not belong to the bank, may I remind you, they belong to depositor A. Bank A lends these $80,000 to borrower B. The borrower B pays bank A interest on the loan. And the difference between the interest that bank A pays to depositor A on his deposit and the interest that bank A charges borrower B, this is the bank's income from these specific operations. And in the meantime, Borrower B takes the money, takes the $80,000 from Bank A and deposits the money that he has received from Bank A as a loan in his own bank, Bank B. Now, Bank B puts aside as a reserve 20% of the money and lends out to Borrower C 80% of the money, $64,000. Borrower C deposits it in Bank C which continues to do the same, 2080, 2080. At this stage, depositor A's money, which started off as $100,000, has multiplied and became $244,000 after two iterations. So $100,000 were deposited with Bank A, and at the end of the chain in Bank C, we have already multiplied the money, and it became $244,000 thousand dollars. Borrower, borrower A has a hundred thousand dollars in his account. Borrower B has eighty thousand dollars in his account. And borrower C has sixty four thousand dollars in his account. Eighty percent of eighty thousand. This process is called credit multiplication. This creates fiat money. Fiat money is a gentle way of saying fake money. The Western credit multiplier is nine. Um, on typ in typical years, and in times of speculation and bubbles, it mushrooms. And this means that every $100,000 deposited with Bank A could theoretically become $900,000, $400,000 in credits, and $500,000 in deposits. So for every $900,000 in the books of the banks, there are only 100,000 physical dollars. Banks are the most heavily leveraged businesses in the known universe. But this is only part of the problem. Another part is that the profit margins of banks are very limited. The hemorrhaging consumers of bank services would probably beg to differ, but banking profits are mostly optical illusions. We can safely say that banks are losing money throughout most of their existence and on many of their operations. Here we come to a concept known as the spread. The spread is the difference between interest paid to depositors and interest collected on loans and credits. The spread in many countries is 2%, 8%, 10%, I mean, it's all over the place. The spread is supposed to cover all the bank's expenses and to leave its shareholders with some profit. But this is a shaky proposition. To understand why, we have to analyze the very concept of interest rates. Virtually every major religion forbids the charging of interest on credits and loans, including Judaism, 
Islam and Christianity, usury. To charge interest is considered to be part usury and part blackmail. People who lend money and charge interest for it are ill-regarded. Remember Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice? So originally, interest was charged on money that was lent out uh, only to the extent that it compensated for the risks associated with the provision of credit in a specific market. There were uh, four such hazards, four such risks, and the interest charge should have compensated for these risks, but not leave the lender with a profit, religiously speaking. First, there is the operational cost of lending the money. Money lenders are engaged in arbitrage and the brokering of funds. In other words, money lenders borrow the money that they then lend on. They are normally costs of transportation, communication, business overheads, and so on and so forth. These costs should be covered. The second risk is the risk of inflation. Inflation erodes the value of money used to repay credits. In quotidian terms, as time passes, the lender can buy progressively less with the money paid or repaid by the borrower. The purchasing power of the money diminishes. The measure of this erosion is called inflation and it's a risk. Interest charged on a loan should compensate for overhead, should compensate for inflation, but not only, because there's another risk, and it's a risk of scarcity. Money is a rare and valued commodity. Once money is lent, it is out of the lender's hands, exchange for mere promises, papers, contracts, and often illiquid collaterals. If, for example, uh, for instance, uh, if a bank lends money at a fixed interest rate, it gives up the opportunity to lend it anew at higher rates. And the last and most obvious risk is the risk of default, when the borrower cannot or would not pay back the credit that the borrower has taken. So four risks, and all these risks have to be offset by the bank's relatively minor, slim profit margin. Hence, the bank's much decried propensity to pay their depositors as symbolically little as they can and to charge borrowers the highest interest rates they can get away with. But banks face a few problems in adopting this seemingly, uh, seemingly straightforward, uh, fail-proof business strategy. What could go wrong? You borrow cheaply by, opening, by allowing people to open deposits with you and then you lend out the money expensively. And the spread is your income. Nothing can go wrong. But many things do go wrong because the very concept of banking is problematic. Interest rates are an instrument of monetary policy. As such, interest rates are centrally dictated by a central bank. Interest rates are used to control the money supply and the monetary aggregates. And through these, to fine-tune economic activity. Governors of central banks, where central banks are autonomous, and ministers of finance, where central banks are more subservient to politicians, they raise interest rates in order to contain economic activity and its inflationary effects. Um, governors and ministers cut interest rates in order to prevent an economic slowdown and to facilitate the soft lending of a booming economy. Despite the fact that banks and credit card companies, which are really banks, despite the fact that they print their own money, remember the credit multiplier? They do not control the money supply or the interest rate that they are forced to charge their clients. This is centrally dictated. And I repeat, we raise interest rates to contain economic activity, to contain inflation, um, and to soft land a booming economy. We cut interest rates to prevent an economic slowdown. All this is done outside the, outside the purview and the remit and the power of banks. And this creates paradoxes. The higher the interest rate, the higher the cost of financing 
payable by businesses and households. In other words, the higher the interest rates, the more money the bank gets. If if the um, credits are floating rate credits. So businesses and households are forced to pay banks higher interest rates for loans and credits they've taken. And they, in turn, increase the prices of products and services to reflect this mounting cost of money. We can say that to some extent, rather than prevent it, higher interest rates contribute to inflation, <laughs> to the readjustment of the general price level. Also, the higher the interest rates, the more money earned by the banks. They lend this extra money to borrowers and they multiply it through the credit multipliers. So higher interest rates encourage inflation from another angle altogether. They sustain an unrealistic exchange rate between the domestic and foreign currencies. People would rather hold the currency which yields higher interest, the domestic one. They buy the domestic one and they sell all the other currencies. Conversions of foreign exchange into local currency are net contributors to inflation. On the other hand, a high exchange rate also increases the prices of imported products. Still, it's true that higher interest rates contribute to inflation via the vectors that I've just described. But in the long run, they suppress inflation, inflation by subduing consumption and investment, business investment. There's another interesting phenomenon. High interest rates are supposed to ameliorate the effects of soaring default rates. In other words, the higher the interest rate, the more money the bank makes, and then it can cover, cover the losses from defaults. In some countries where the payment, mor payment morale is low and default rates are stratospheric, the banks charge incredibly high interest rates in order to compensate for this specific default risk. But high interest rates make it difficult to repay loans. If you're a borrower and interest rates go through the roof, for example, on mortgages, you would find it very difficult to pay back your loans and credits. And this may tip certain obligations from performing to non-performing. In other words, you would have paid the loan at the interest, at interest rate stay reasonable, but now that interest rates have skyrocketed, you're no longer in the position to repay your credits. Even debtors who pay small amounts of interest in a timely fashion often find it impossible to defray larger interest charges. And so high interest rates increase the risk of default rather than reduce it. Not only are interest rates a blunt and inefficient instrument, but they are also not set by the banks. So they don't reflect the microeconomic realities with which banks are forced to cope. Specific industries, households, individuals. Should interest rates be determined by each bank separately, according to the composition and risk profile of the portfolio of the bank? Should banks have the authority to print money notes as they did throughout the 18th and 19th centuries? The advent of virtual cash, cryptocurrencies and electronic banking may bring about these outcomes even without the complicity of the state or the central bank. Banks are institutions where miracles happen regularly. We rarely entrust our money to anyone but ourselves. Would you entrust your money to your brother? No. Give me a break. Of course you won't. But you would entrust your money to a bank, which is like 90% less safe than your brother. Despite a very checkered history of mismanagement, corruption, false promises, malfeasance, false representations, delusions, and behavioral inconsistency, despite this uninterrupted history, banks still succeed to motivate us to give them our money. This is the feeling that there is safety in numbers. The fashionable term today is moral hazard. The implicit guarantees of the state and of other financial institutions move us to take risks which otherwise we would have never taken, we would have avoided. And it is the sophistication of the banks in marketing and promoting themselves and their products 
glossy brochures, professional computer and video presentations, vast shrine-like real estate complexes. They all serve to convey a message. We are safe to enhance the image of the banks, the temples, the new religion of money. But what is behind all this facade? How can we judge the soundness of our banks? In other words, how can we tell if the money, our money, is safely tucked away in a safe haven or not? The reflex is to go to the bank's balance sheets, financial statements. Banks and balance sheets have both been invented in the modern form in the 15th century. A balance sheet coupled with other financial statements is supposed to provide you with a real and true picture of the health of the bank, its past and long-term prospects, and generally whether it will survive long enough to give you your money back. The surprising thing is that despite common opinion, financial statements are useless. Financial statements of banks are useless. Useless unless you know how to read between the lines. Financial statements, income or profit and loss statement, cash flow statement, balance sheet, etc., etc., they come in many forms. Sometimes they conform to Western accounting standards, the generally accepted accounting principles, or less rigorous and more fuzzily worded international accounting standards, GAAP or IAS. Otherwise, Financial statements conform to local accounting standards, which often leave a lot to be desired, mind you. <laughs> Still, you should look for banks which make their updated financial reports available to you. The best choice would be a bank that is audited by one of the big three Western accounting firms, a bank that makes its audit reports publicly available. Such audited financial statements should consolidate the financial results of the bank with the financial results of its subsidiaries or associated companies. A lot often hides in those corners of corporate holdings, and that's a major problem. The bank, the bank acts as a shell company. It has off-balance sheet entities, and we've all witnessed the outcome of this brilliant idea in 2008 and 9. Banks are rated by independent agencies. The most famous and most reliable of the lot is Fitch Ratings. Another one is Moody's. These agencies assign letter and number combinations to the banks, and these combinations reflect the, stabi the alleged stability, ostensible stability of the bank. Most agencies differentiate the short-term viability of the bank from the long-term longevity prospects. Every bank institution, banking institution is rated short-term and long-term, exactly like bonds. Some of these bank, some of these agencies even study and, and rate and issue, uh, they study issues such as the legality of the operations of the bank, so they issue legal rating. Ostensibly, all the concern, all, if you're concerned, all you have to do is to step up to the bank manager, master the courage, and ask for the bank's rating. Unfortunately, life is more complicated than rating agencies would have us believe. They failed miserably during the last Great Recession financial crisis. Rating agencies base themselves mostly on the financial results of the bank. And these are rated as a reliable gauge of the financial strength or the financial profile of the bank. But nothing is further from the truth, of course. <laughs> Even if the financial statements are audited, nothing still is further from the truth. Admittedly, the financial results do contain a few hints. Notice, I'm not using the word important facts. I'm saying hints. Because the aim of financial statements is to obfuscate facts, to hide things in plain view. One is to look beyond the naked figures, to get the real, often much less encouraging, picture. Consider, for example, the thorny issue of exchange rates. Financial statements are calculated, some, sometimes they're stated in US dollars in addition to the local currency, but they're calculated using the exchange rate prevailing on the 31st of December 
or the fiscal year to which the statements refer. In a country with a volatile domestic currency, this would tend to completely distort the true picture. And even internationally, movements of 2 to 3% a month are not unusual. 2 to 3% could wipe out the entire profit margin of a big bank. Okay. And many banks are exposed to foreign exchange risk. This is especially true if a big chunk of the activity uh, in foreign exchange preceded the arbitrary cutoff date. So if you did a lot of business in the three months preceding December 31st, this would distort the picture. The same apply to financial statements, which are not inflation adjusted in countries with high inflation. And this is a problem we are facing today globally from Sweden to Macedonia, from the United States to, to Russia. Inflation strikes again. And yet, in many countries, statements are not inflation adjusted. So, a statement that is not inflation adjusted would look inflated. It would even ref reflect profits where actually there are heavy losses in real terms, inflation adjusted. Average amounts accounting, which makes use of average exchange rates throughout the year, <laughs> is even more misleading. The only way to truly reflect reality is, is if the bank were to keep two sets of accounts, one in the local currency and one in a foreign, major foreign currency, a reserve currency, such as the United States dollar. The second account would serve as a reference to the first account. Otherwise, fictitious growth in the asset base due to inflation or currency fluctuations could and very often does result. Another example. In many countries, changes in regulations can greatly affect the financial statements of a bank. Take, for example, Russia. In 1996, Russia, the Bank of Russia, changed the algorithm for calculating an important banking ratio, the capital to risk weighted assets ratio. Unless a, bank, a Russian bank restated its previous financial statements accordingly, a sharp change in profitability appeared from nowhere. <laughs> the net assets themselves are always misstated. The figure refers to the situation on the 31st of December. A 48-hour loan given to a collaborating client or another bank can inflate the asset base on the crucial date of the 31st of December. This misrepresentation is only mildly ameliorated by the introduction of an average assets calculus. Moreover, some of the assets can be interest earning and performing, other assets are non-performing. In other words, interest is not paid in a timely fashion. If the maturity distribution of the assets is also of primary importance, because if most of the bank's assets can be withdrawn by the clients on a very short notice on demand, the bank can swiftly find itself in trouble with a run on the assets leading to ultimate insolvency. So the distribution of the assets, loans given in the last minute, I mean, there are many ways to manipulate balance sheets and financial statements. Another, another often used figure is the net income of the bank. It is important to distinguish interest income from non-interest income. In an open, sophisticated credit market, the income from interest differentials should be minimal because the market is efficient. It should reflect the risk plus a reasonable component of income to the bank, some profit. But in many countries, and I'm not talking about only about countries like Russia, I'm talking about Japan, for example. In many countries, the government subsidizes banks by lending to them cheap money through the central bank or through bonds. This is especially prevalent in China, for example. The banks then proceed to lend the cheap funds that they have received from the state at exorbitant rates to their own customers. And so they reap enormous interest income in the form of arbitrage 
In many countries, the income from government securities is tax-free, which represents another form of subsidy. A high income from interest is a sign of weakness, not a sign of health, because it's here today, gone tomorrow. The preferred indicator should be income from operations, from fees, commissions, and other charges. There are a few key ratios you should observe when you try to, when you try to ascertain or to judge the health of a bank. A relevant question is whether the bank is accredited with international banking agencies. These agencies issue regulatory capital requirements and other mandatory ratios. Compliance with these demands and these ratios is a minimum in the absence of which a ba the bank should and can be regarded as positively dangerous. The return on the bank's equity is the net income divided by its average equity. The return on the bank's assets. So the first one is ROE. The return on the bank's assets, ROA, is the net income of the bank divided by its average assets. The tier one or total capital divided by the bank's risk-weighted assets measures is a measure of the bank's capital adequacy. Most banks follow the provisions of the Basel Accord as set by the Basel Committee of Bank Supervision, Supervision, also known as G10. This could be misleading because the accord is ill-equipped to deal with risks associated with emerging markets. The Basel Accord caters mostly to well-funded banks in rich countries. It doesn't know how to cope with developing countries, emerging markets, and so on. And so you should be very careful and wary. In some of these countries, the default rates are 10%. In, many, in some of these countries, the default rates are 33%. And this is the norm. Finally, there is a ratio known as common stock to total assets. But, you know, you can scan all these issues. They're useful. You should acquaint yourself with them. But they are not cure-alls. They are not panacea. They're not a solution. Inasmuch as the quantities that comprise these ratios can be played with, can be massaged and manipulated, they can be subject to distortion. It is true that it is better to have high ratios than low ratios. It goes without saying. High ratios are, are indicative of a bank's underlying strength, reserves, provisions, and therefore the ability of the bank to expand its business and not to fail. Yeah, that's that's absolutely goes without saying. A strong bank can also um, participate in various programs, uh, offerings and auctions of the central bank or the Ministry of Finance. The larger the share of the bank's earnings that is retained in the bank and not distributed as profits to shareholders, the better these ratios are and the bank's resilience to credit risks. And still, having said that, these ratios should be taken with a mountain of salt, not a grain, not a grain, mountain. Not even the bank's profit margin, the ratio of net income to total income. Not even the bank's asset utiliz utilization coefficient, the ratio of income to average, average assets. Not even these ratios should be relied upon, definitely not exclusively. They could be the result of hidden subsidies by the government or management misjudgment or understatement of credit risks. Now, this sounds crazy what I just said. Aren't these measures or ratios objective? No, they are not. They depend on estimates and evaluations. Let me elaborate a bit. Let me give you examples. A bank can borrow cheap money from the central bank. A bank can pay low interest to depositors and savers. A bank can invest money in secure government bonds, earning much higher interest income from the bond's coupon payments. The end result of all these gimmicks, all these stratagems, the end result is a rise in the bank's income and profitability due to non-productive, non-lasting arbitrage operations. Otherwise, the bank's management can understate the amounts of bad loans carried on the bank's books, and so decreasing the necessary set-asides and increasing profitability. The financial statements of banks reflect the management's appraisal of the business. 
And this has proven to be, and this has proven to be a very poor guide. And I've just given you the understatement of the past two million millennia. In the main financial results of the bank's books, special attention should be paid to provisions for the devaluation of securities and to the unrealized difference in the currency position. This is especially true if the bank is holding a major part of the assets in the form of financial investments or loans and a major part of the equity invested in securities or in foreign exchange denominated instruments. It's exposure to risk. Securities fluctuate. So does foreign exchange. Separately, a bank can be trading for its own position, Nostro, either as a market maker or as a trader. The profit or the loss on securities trading has to be discounted because it is conjectural and incidental to the bank's main activities. Bank's main activities are to take deposits and to make loans. Everything and anything else the bank does is either a bonus or a disaster, but it's never part of the core business and the core identity of banking in general and any bank in particular. Pay no heed and no attention to, to these other activities, deposit taking and loan making. Of course, I'm, I'm talking about commercial banking not investment banking. Most banks deposit some of their assets with other banks. This is normally considered to be a way of diversifying or spreading the risk. But in highly volatile economies with sickly underdeveloped financial sectors, all the institutions in this sector are likely to move in tandem. It's a highly correlated. Most markets are highly correlated. In other words, contagion is very common. Cross deposits among banks only serve to increase the risks of the depositing bank. And, and an example is, of course, Toko Bank in Russia and the banking crisis in South Korea. In both these cases, cross deposits between banks exacerbated the situation. Further closer to the balance, uh, to the bottom line, are the bank's operating expenses salaries, depreciation, fixed or capital assets, real estate, equipment, administrative expenses. The rule of thumb is, the higher these expenses, the weaker the bank. The great historian Arnold Toynbee once said that great civilizations collapse immediately after they bequeath to us the most impressive structures, buildings. This is doubly true with banks. If you see a bank fervently engaged in the construction of palatial branches, Stay away, it's going to collapse. Banks are risk arbitrageurs. They live off the mismatch between assets and liabilities. They're parasites. To the best of their ability, banks try to second guess the markets and reduce such a mismatch by assuming part of the risk and by engaging in portfolio management. And for this, they charge fees and commissions, interests and profits, which constitute their sources of income. If any expertise is widely imputed to the banking system, attributed to the banking system, it is risk management. They're supposed to know to manage risks. They even have um, VAR, risk models. Banks are supposed to adequately assess, control and minimize credit risks. They're required to implement credit rating mechanisms, credit, an credit analysis, value at risk models that I mentioned. Uh, Banks are supposed to be efficient and exclusive information gathering systems. They're supposed to put in place the right lending policies and procedures to safeguard against risks. And just in case they misread the market risks, just in case the market risks turn into credit risks, which happens only too often, alas, banks are supposed to put aside amounts of money which could realistically offset Loan, loans and credits gone sour, or future non-performing assets. Reserves, provisions. These are the loan, loss, reserves and provisions. Loans are supposed to be constantly monitored, reclassified, and charges should be made against them as applicable. If you see a bank with zero reclassifications, <coughs> zero charge-offs, very low recoveries, Either the bank is lying through its teeth 
lying through its teeth or it is not taking the business of banking seriously or its management is no less than divine in its prescience. What is important to look at is the rate of provision for loan losses as a percentage of the loans outstanding. Then it should be compared to the percentage of non-performing loans out of the loans outstanding. If the two figures are out of kilter, not coordinated, either someone is pulling your leg or the management is incompetent or is lying to you. The first thing new owners of a bank do usually is improve the placed asset quality. It's a polite way of saying that they get rid of bad non-performing loans, whether they are declared or not. They do this by classifying the loans. Most central banks in the world have in place regulations for loan classification. And if acted upon, these regulations yield rather more reliable results than any management's appraisal or evaluation, no matter how well-intentioned, by the way. I'm not attributing criminal intent, mens rea, to, to management. In some countries, the central bank or the supervision of the banks forces banks to set aside provisions against loans at the highest risk categories, even if they're performing. And this by far should be the preferable method. Of the two sides of the balance sheet, the asset side is more critical to the bank. Within the asset side, the interest earning assets deserve the greatest attention. What percentage of the credits is commercial? What percentage is given to individuals? How many borrowers are there? Risk diversification is inversely proportional to exposure to single or large borrowers. How many of the transactions are with related parties? How much is in local currency? How much is in foreign currencies and which foreign currencies? A large exposure to foreign currency lending is not necessarily healthy. A sharp, unexpected devaluation could move a lot of the borrowers into non-performance and default, adversely affect the quality of the portfolio of the asset base. In which financial vehicles and instruments is the bank invested and how risky are they? You need to ask all these questions. No less important is the maturity structure of the assets. It is an integral part of the liquidity risk management of the bank. The crucial question is this. What are the cash flows projected from the maturity dates of the different assets and liabilities and how likely are, there, are they to materialize? Are they matched well? A rough matching has to, has to exist between the various maturities of the assets and the liabilities. The cash flows generated by the assets of the bank must be used to finance the cash flows resulting from the bank's liabilities, in, or in other words, your deposits. A distinction has to be made between stable and hot funds. Hot funds are in constant pursuit of, pursuit of higher yields. Here today, gone tomorrow, in this bank today, in another tomorrow. Liquidity indicators and alerts have to be set in place and calculated a few times a day, not once a year. Gaps, especially in the short-term category between a bank's assets and its liabilities, are a very worrying sign. But the bank's macroeconomic environment is as important to the, for the determination of its financial health. The credit worthiness of a bank is determined by ratios, by micro-analysis, micro but also by the macroeconomic environment. The state of the financial market sometimes has a larger bearing on a bank's soundness than other factors. A fine example is the effect that interest rates or devaluation have on a bank's profitability and capitalization. These are macroeconomic factors. The implied, not to mention the explicit support of the authorities, of other banks, of investors, domestic, international, this sets the psychological background to any future developments. And this is logical. This is reasonable. In an unstable financial environment, knock-on effects are more likely. Banks deposit money with other banks on a security basis. Still, the value of securities and collaterals is as good as the liquidity and as the market itself. The variability to do business, for instance, in the syndicated loan market, is influenced by the larger picture. Falling equity markets herald trading losses, loss of income from trading operations, and so on. Perhaps the single most important factor is the general level of interest rates in the economy.
It determines the present value of foreign exchange and local currency denominated government debt. It influences the balance between realized and unrealized losses on longer term commercial or other paper. One of the most important liquidity generation instruments is the repo, the repurchase agreement. Banks sell their portfolios of government debt with an obligation to buy it back at a later date, sometimes within one day. If interest rates shoot up, the losses on repos can trigger margin calls, demands to immediately pay the losses or else materialize them by buying the securities back. This could wipe out the entire capital of a bank. It has happened. <laughs> margin calls are a drain on liquidity. And so in an environment of rising interest rates, repos could absorb liquidity from the banks, deflate rather than inflate. The same principle applies to leverage instrument vehicles used by the bank to improve the returns of its securities trading operations. High interest rates here can have an even more, more painful outcome. As liquidity is crunched, the banks are forced to materialize their trading losses. And this is bound to put added pressure on the prices of financial assets, trigger more margin calls, and squeeze liquidity further. It's a vicious circle of monstrous momentum once it is commenced. But high interest rates, as we mentioned, also strain the asset side of the balance sheet by applying pressure to borrowers. The same goes for a devaluation. Liabilities connected to foreign exchange grow with a devaluation with no immediate corresponding increase in local prices to compensate the borrower. Market risk is, so, is, is rapidly transformed to credit risk when there's a devaluation. Um, um, for example, when interest rates shoot up, again, market risk transforms into borrower risk. Borrower default, borrowers default on obligations much more in an inflationary environment or where interest rates go up. Loan loss provisions need to be increased, in eating into the bank's liquidity and profitability even further. Banks are tempted very often to play with their reserve coverage levels in order to increase their reported profits. And this raises a real concern regarding the adequacy of the levels of loan loss reserves in many banks. Only an increase in the equity base can then assuage the justified fears of the market. But such an increase can come only through foreign investment in most cases. And foreigners are leery when interest rates are going up and inflation is biting. Foreign investment is usually a last resort, a pariah solution. Um, we have examples all over the world from Southeast Asia to the Czech Republic, to Japan, to China, and now to, to Switzerland with Credit Suisse. In the past, the thinking was that some of the risk could be ameliorated by hedging in forward markets, by selling the risk to willing risk buyers. But a hedge is only as good as a counterparty that provides the hedge. And in a market besieged by knock-on insolvencies, this comfort is cold and dubious. We saw it in 2008-2009. In most emerging markets, for instance, there are no natural sellers of foreign exchange. Companies prefer to hoard the stuff, to hoard forex. And so forwards are considered to be a variety of gambling with a default, in case of substantial losses, a very plausible way out. Banks depend on lending for their survival. The lending base, in turn, depends on the quality of lending opportunities. In high-risk markets, this depends on the possibility of connected lending and on the quality of the collaterals offered by the borrowers. Whether the borrowers have qualitative collaterals to offer is a direct outcome of the liquidity of the market and on how they use the proceeds of the lending. So you see, everything is interconnected. These two elements are intimately linked with the banking system. <laughs> and so the penultimate vicious circle, the ultimate vicious circle is here, where no functioning and professional banking system exists, no good borrowers will emerge. I will end by elaborating a bit on Basel III. In the wake of the Great Recession, 2007 to 2009, shall we say, a crisis largely of the financial system. The International Basel Committee and the group of central bank governors and heads of supervision, comprised of central bankers, banking supervisors and regulators. This comi these committees 
more than doubled the amount of equity that central banks must have to 4.5%. And this became tier one equity. Another 2.5% of the bank's assets must be held as an equity conservation buffer to be amortized and deployed in a case of emergency. Banks which resort to the buffer must, however, augment their capital by any legal means possible. For instance, by not distributing dividends, by divesting non-core assets, or by issuing new stock. Yet another 1.5% of the balance sheet must be held in less than equity quality investment vehicles. And the total leverage ratio must never go below 3% in equity. Admittedly, admittedly a liberal number, mind you. Very frightening. Moreover, regulators can impose the equivalent of yet another 2.5% in risk-weighted assets, including off-balance sheet assets, such as derivatives, in the form of a counter-cyclical buffer. So regulators can impose a counter-cyclical buffer on certain assets, like off-balance sheet assets, derivatives. This is intended to counter the pro-cyclical nature of most capital requirements and reserves regimes. The more assets prices rise and commensurate risks increase, the less the capital set aside as loans are deemed safer by greedy bankers whose compensation is tied to the institution's short-term profits and performance. The Basel III regime has to be fully implemented, yet to be fully implemented. It was supposed to have been implemented fully by 2019. It was a concession to undercapitalized banking sectors and various EU members, notably Germany, by the way. Ironically, the Basel Committee was created in 1974, following the failure of a German bank and an ensuing near collapse of the currency markets. <laughs> so Germany seems to drive reform in banking in the banking sector in a bad way. Indeed, the Basel regime is as strong as its weakest link. Multilateralism has its price. So does globalization. And this inbuilt frailty forces the committee to remain vague on what constitutes capital, on disclosure regarding derivatives, and on the loaded issue of subordinated debt versus corporate bonds. Subordinated debt would force banks to become a lot more transparent and is likely to foster unwanted, undesired shareholder activism. So yes, even the Basel Accord has been compromised by the banking sector, the almighty banking sector. The only force, only power, which counted balances, supposed to counterbalance, counterweigh the commercial and investment banking sectors are the central banks. The topic of our next disquisition.